Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It is my honor and pleasure to also welcome you all um, on behalf of Indigenous Education in the Faculty of Education to this wonderful presentation. I'm really excited and I hope that you are too because we have a wonderful guest, uh, Mr. Michael Avaluk Guzadak, who will um, share stories of having lived up, uh, lived in, um, and grown up and raised in um, Repulse Bay, which is in the area of Nunavut, living a totally traditional life and having heard stories from his grandmother as they travel from one place to another by dog sled. Where he um, learned all these stories, he's a gifted storyteller and I think um, we are in for a treat today. Those of you who saw the poster, where he's all covered in snow, um, and the title of this presentation being Totally Cool Stories. Harris in this uh, Datsun truck. And um, if you remember, um, what was his name? Jed Clampett. <laughs> you know, from the Be Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> there was an old guy sitting on the side of the road, and, and it was in those days, you know, when people carried around all these placards, you know, take me here, take me there. Uh, Alaska or bust, you know, all those signs. And there was this old guy who looked like Jed Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies with his old hat, and he had a big sign that said, Keep BC beautiful, take me to Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear if I had. You know, if I was heading to Alberta, I would have picked him up. He would have, I'm sure he had some nice stories to tell. <laughs> anyway, um, I grew up, uh, if you think of uh, Hudson Bay, uh, it's a great big bay in uh, sort of the, uh, not quite in the middle of Canada, it's uh, over to the, to the east. And uh, I discovered that Hudson Bay is the second biggest bay in the world. Uh, the only bay bigger than Hudson Bay is the one called the Bay of Bengal in India. And I grew up uh, right up at the very north end of Hudson Bay, right on the Arctic Circle. And up there, in the middle of the winter, the sun doesn't quite come up. It almost comes up over the horizon, but then it goes back down again. In the summer, the sun doesn't quite go down. It just goes around and around and around and around, and around all day and all night long. So. In the winter, it's almost always night, and in the summer, it's almost always day. And when I was a little boy, uh, I remember early, early in the morning, my father would get up, he would go outside, he would look at the weather to see what it was going to do, and then he would take our sled and he would turn it over. We use these huge sleds with two runners and cross pieces that are all tied together in a very special way. And um, when I was a little boy, you know, on the bottoms of our sleds, we didn't have plastic uh, the way we do today. Uh, we had frozen mud all along the bottoms of our sled runners. So my father would take the sled, he would turn it over, he would take a piece of polar bear skin and a kettle of water, he would pour the water on the polar bear skin and he would rub it along the bottoms of the sled runners. He would let the water freeze, so we ended up with this nice layer of ice all along the bottoms of our sled runners. And that's what we traveled on. And when my father was all finished icing the sled, he would turn it back up. We would take all our stuff out from inside our igloo. We would put them on the sled. We would roll them up in huge skins and tie them all down. And then we would hitch our dogs to our sled, and we would go traveling all day long. Well, where we come from, there are no trees. There is not one single tree that grows where we come from. And because we have no trees to get in the way, we hitch our dogs all on separate lines. So every dog has his very own line. We might have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 dogs. They all have their own lines. The dogs that like to run get the longest lines and the lazy ones get the short ones. <laughs> and, um, and we were going along, the dogs would jump over each other, over and over and over and over, until their lines were so tangled that they couldn't run anymore. 
we would stop. My father would take all the lines off the dogs. He would untangle them all. My mother would make us lunch, and after lunch, we'd go traveling all the rest of the day. And you know, some, uh, sometimes it gets a little cool. And before we had this thing called global warming, um, the coldest day I remember in Rankin Inlet, uh, on the west coast of Hudson Bay, about halfway up where we come from, um, the coldest day was 52 below. Uh, 52 below Celsius, and that was before we started uh, measuring temperature with uh, wind chill. And it was really, really windy that day, so with the wind chill, I have no idea, 75, 80 below uh, with the wind chill. And if you're going to be outside all day long, <coughs> you have to wear some really, really warm clothing. So we wore the warmest clothing in the world. I had a caribou skin coat, which was like a sweatshirt with a hood, and it had fur on the inside. So I had caribou fur right up against my skin. On top of that, I had another caribou skin coat, and it had the fur on the outside. So I kind of looked like, <laughs> you know, uh, when you're little and your mom gets cold and she puts layers and layers and layers of clothing and you can hardly move. And even then, when I was sitting on a sled for a long time, just bouncing up and down. After a while, I would start to get cold. And when I got cold, I would jump off the sled. I would run along beside the sled until I got all warmed up. Then I would sit back down again. And sometimes, I didn't even have to jump off because we would hit a bump and I would fall off. <laughs> and I'd have to, have to catch up, so. We traveled like that all day long. And <clears throat> at night, when we stopped, my father would build an igloo. And when the igloo was all ready, we'd go inside, we'd bring all our stuff inside. My mother and my grandmother would light a big stone seal oil lamp called a kudlik. They would start to cook us something to eat. They would heat up the inside of the igloo a little bit because sometimes it was really quite cold. And then they would make up a bed, a nice big bed with lots of warm furs. And every night after I finished eating, I'd go to bed and when I went to bed, I would say to my grandmother, And my grandmother would say, Grandmother, please tell me a story. But I have no story to tell. Grandmother, please tell me a story. But I have no story to tell. And after I asked her many, many times, she would finally say, okay, settle down and I'll tell you a story. And my grandmother told me some of the most wonderful stories I have ever heard. My most favorite story was the one that goes like this. <laughs> You like that story? <laughs> it's a story about a little girl and her grandmother. And they get left behind all by themselves in their igloo. And then a little bird came. It broke the window. It said, but I thought that you could flew away. And that was the story. And I really loved that story. And I would ask my grandmother to tell it to me over and over and over again until she got tired of it. And then she wouldn't want to tell it to me anymore. So. I would ask her again, and she would say, Grandmother, please tell me another story. But I have no story to tell. But of course, my grandmother always had lots and lots of stories to tell. Well, my people are called Inuit. You know, a long time ago, when the Europeans first came, you know, they sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and they landed in North America. And when they got here, uh, they said, oh, wonderful, we made it to India. <laughs> <laughs> and they saw all these people and they said, Indians. And that's why we have Indians in North America. <laughs> you know? 
And, um, and those people asked the Indians, who are those strange people who live way, way, way up north in snow houses? And the Indians said, Eskimos. You see, Eskimo is a Cree word, and it means people who eat raw meat. And one day, our people decided, we don't want to be called that anymore, so we petitioned the government of Canada, and we said, please don't call us Eskimos anymore, call us Inuit. And Inuit just means people. That's all it means, and that is why we're called Inuit today. And you know where the only Eskimos left in Canada are? Edmonton. <laughs> Yeah, they're called the Edmonton Eskimos, and they play football. <laughs> well, Inuit live all across the north. Um, Inuit live in Siberia. Inuit live in Alaska. Inuit live all across northern Canada, including northern Quebec and Labrador. And Inuit also live in Greenland. And how many languages does, do we speak? One. Not 37 or... <laughs> we have that many words for snow. <laughs> but we only speak one language. Um, so I can talk to people from Alaska in my own language. I can talk to people from Greenland. But as you go along the north, the language changes from place to place. There are different dialects of Inuktitut. So by the time you go from Rankin in that where we come from, uh, and you go to Greenland, you know, it's so far away, and the language changes so much along the way that some of those people up in Greenland are very, very hard to understand. But it is still the same language. Another thing about our people is that we tell the same st stories. And these stories are really, really, really old. They're hundreds, maybe thousands of years old. The most famous person in our stories is a man called Kivio. My grandmother said Kivio was born a long, 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 long time ago, so long ago that he was the very first person on earth. And I used to have a little joke with my grandmother. I would say, Grandmother, if Kivio was the first person, how come he had a mother? <laughs> and my grandmother would say, Don't argue with old people. <laughs> And I wasn't very scared of my grandmother, you know, she was so kind, and so I'd tease her, grandmother, you know he had a mother? So anyway, my grandmother said, Kibio is still alive today, but he is so old, his body is turning to stone. And someday, when his heart turns completely to stone and stops, that will be the end of the universe. And there are many, many, many stories about this man. Well. The very first story about Kivio that I heard 